Good evening. Good evening. It was so inspiring to hear Cherry's story. Everything is possible, including fusion. When we hear the word the force, I'm a physicist. The first thing came to my mind is the forces of nature. The gravitational force, the electromagnetic force, and the nuclear forces, strong and weak. So today, I'll tell you the story of fusion, my own story. And I think it is possible, just like Cherry said. I've been working on fusion for 50 years. 40 years also as a professor of physics. The story really started with Einstein. A hundred years ago, he proposed this little formula called E equal to mc squared. Have you all seen this before? Yes. Yes, of okay. course. But this is amazing. It says inertia is energy. How could that be possible? Inertia is a measure of mass, how heavy it is, etc. Energy is a measure of motion. How can something measure the inertia be also a measure of motion? This is a great equation. But this equation is a result of connecting space and time, connecting mass and motion. With this equation, we realize that it's possible to have a nuclear force that produces nuclear energy. First, nuclear fission. That's the energy of atomic bomb, also the energy for the present nuclear reactor. The second is nuclear fusion. That's the energy of the sun. On Earth is the energy of the H-bomb. We, a group of physicists and engineers, have worked on to control fusion on Earth. That is how to make this explosive force for peaceful use, to generate electricity. Can you imagine the world without electricity? Maybe sometime in this century, the fossil fuel, which produced most of the electricity today, will be exhausted. And then what's the next? So we must look for alternate energy. The most plentiful, the ultimate energy source for mankind, which is both clean and safe, is a nuclear fusion energy. But it's a dream still. But it's a dream we've been working on. So to control fusion is the story I want to tell you. I started working seriously on the theory of to, to control fusion when I was at the Institute for Advanced Study. That's where Einstein spent most of his latter life, more than 20 years, in this place, a little place where we all work very free. No paper to write, no pressure, no exams, no students, no courses. With the perfect freedom, we have to work very hard because we have to think deeply. And I was very fortunate to work with one of the giants in my field. He's called the Pope of Plasma Physics, Marshall Rosenbluth. Every day we we'll talk a little bit in the morning over the tea and chat, everything. And then in the evening, we'll compare notes, what we have produced during the day. And every day in and out, so that's four years I spent at the Institute was the most productive years of my life. And I wish we can create such an institute, such atmosphere here in the University of Macau. My next door neighbor in the Institute works on the solar neutrinos. That's the story of the energy of the sun. Do you wonder why the sun is shining and Earth is not? because the sun is half a million times heavier than Earth. 
and the gravitational pull is so strong that the center of the sun are 15 million degrees or higher, and fusion is, not, is possible. In the course of the sun, we have the process in which four protons through fusion can turn into a helium. In the process, tremendous amount of energy is released to heat up the whole sun, including the surface. And the surface of the sun, we call it solar radiation, it's the heat energy from the surface. Thus, the solar radiation powered the whole Earth, including the plant and the life we have. But the most remarkable is the little neutrino coming out. In fact, the only way we know that the sun is burning the fusion fire is by detecting the neutrinos. That's a difficult job. Only detected in the beginning of the century, in 2002, Jack Davis and Koshiba won the Nobel Prize for detecting solar neutrinos. So we know the sun is burning because of fusion. Same with all the stars shining. On Earth, we had already demonstrated fusion possible because of H-bomb. So in 1952, H-bomb exploded. And H-bomb is more than 1,000 times the power of atomic bomb. And now we have over 10,000 H-bombs in the world. It can destroy our world many, many times over. But fortunately, scientists all over the world are working together for controlled fusion to contain the terrible energy of explosion for peaceful use. I was lucky I worked in the General Atomic in San Diego for five years as a director of theory division. Here is the most advanced form of a magnetic bottle to contain the very high temperature plasma for fusion. And this is the Chinese version of a tokamak called EAST, where I've been the director of their International Advisory Committee, the chairman, for the last decade. This is the most amazing story of a superconducting magnetic field, which need almost minus 270 degrees below zero to contain a 100 million degree plasma inside. But our Chinese colleague in Hefei was able to do it because the able directorship of Li Jiangang and his predecessors they are the most amazing leaders of Chinese fusion efforts. This is what's going to happen in the next four years. It's called International Thermonuclear Testing Reactor, ITER. This is the collaborative effort of all the countries in Europe, EU, plus America, plus China, plus India, plus Japan, all working together to build this probably the most expensive piece of scientific installation at a cost of about over 20 billion euros. And you will finish four years from now. And then in, within 20 years, we hope to have the ignition, the lighting of the fusion fire, where we hope the fusion will produce more power than the energy we put in to heat up the plasma. So this is the timeline of ITER. So with ITER, we hope eventually with all this really collective effort of thousands of scientists and engineers worldwide, we will be able to demonstrate the there's no scientific obstacle on the road to fusion. And then when it's demonstrated, we'll build a demo. With it successful, we can then proceed to build a fusion reactor with enough engineering, 
enough uh, material science uh, come along with it. That's really the dream uh, of next generation. Hopefully, this will be the energy to power the 21st century uh, modern world. Why is fusion so desirable? Well, first of all, it's unlimited. The fuel is from the heavy water from the sea. When we extract the heavy hydrogen from the water, we can turn one gallon of water, seawater, into the energy equivalent of 300 gallons of gasoline. It's basically unlimited. Second, it's fail safe. If something wrong with the fusion reactor, its temperature cannot be high, then it will not work anymore. So therefore, it's intrinsically fail safe. And thirdly, of course, it produced no CO2 emission. So it will avoid the greenhouse effect. And finally, it's about 1,000 times less radioactive than the present nuclear reactor. So with this, I think it will be a really ideal energy source for mankind. But on the way to it, it's still a long, long way to go with many scientific, technical problems. It will take truly international collaborations. So I would say in order to achieve fusion, we need not only the fusion of nuclei, we need the fusion of people, of cultures, of religions, of people can really, of all different backgrounds, can work together. In my 50 years working in the field of fusion, I find it's really most satisfying to be able to work with most brilliant minds of the world internationally, regardless of their background. And we have the common purpose, that is to create the energy for the future generation. It certainly I would not be able to see in my lifetime the use of fusion, but I hope I can see the lighting of the fusion fire. Now, in order to understand fusion, to make it work, we have to understand the basic physics underlying the fusion process and also the physics for the fusion environment that's called plasma. Plasma is the fourth state of matter. Solid, when you heat up the solid, it becomes water. Heat up water, it becomes vapor. And then when you heat up the vapor, it becomes ionized gas. And that's plasma. So plasma is the state of fire, a cosmic fire. 99% of our visible universe is in the state. So 30 some years ago, I was most proud of myself because I'm one of the master of plasma physics. I understand more the universe than most of any other people. But then over the last 30 years, we learn actually the universe is so much unknown that there's dark matter maybe 23% of universe is in the form of dark matter. And then there's dark energy, because exceeding at the very distant uh, part of universe is moving faster, accelerating. And that can only be accounted by what we call dark energy. The dark means we don't understand. So we're ignorant what they are, be it energy or matter. So 76% of universe, we know nothing about them. Only 4% are the visible universe, the sun, the stars, the intergalactic uh, gases, etc. So you can see, I'm actually so happy there's so many young people here. You have such a huge frontier to explore in science, and you have so much to do to bring the energy of unlimited and clean to the world for humanity. So there's a great deal we can do together for the purpose of fusion. And really, in order to do that, you have to discipline yourself.
just like Cherry had done. You have to make yourself a big dream to release your most creative potential because young people, you, have the real, you are the real force of the future. And I've witnessed the force of collective brain power. When two people or three working together, it can be so creative. So I think each one of you are the most, can be the most creative genius if you work together in an environment that is free and nourishing. That's why we're, we're here at University of Macau. Try to produce an environment like the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, where students and faculty and all can be very free to explore the, the unknown, learn about the society, learn about nature in a way that can fully release your creative energy. Make the Macau the most creative place on earth. Thank you.